Well, good morning and welcome to Zen Fits. Uh, I'm back. I went uh, south of the border this weekend and I came back a day early. I couldn't get wait to get back to see you. <laughs> so, you know, uh, if anybody ever goes to Florida or even South Carolina on 95, uh, you go by south of the border. Uh, it's a huge uh, stop that ever, that has uh, billboards all the way up 50 miles or on either side of the border between North Carolina, South Carolina, and uh, Pedro signs. And they've always been funny and amusing, and they make you want to stop because they're 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 creative. And so this and it's grown over the years. A big sombrero and and dot of stop and everything, and it's, I don't know if it's still as exciting as it was, because once you go there, uh, you don't need to go again. So, but anyway, I have a lot to pack in this morning, and so, uh, and I, I haven't written this all down, so well, let's see how it unfolds, but the idea here is that uh, there, I'm connecting some dots here, and the south of the border on 95 and the equator, which is the south of, which divides the earth into north and south, uh, is um, connecting. Uh, and when a sailor or a ship goes over the equator, there's always usually a ceremony. Uh, 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 it's a passage. Uh, it's an initiation. Uh, you get an award. You get a chart. Uh, sailors used to get tattoos uh, to show they've been to the South Seas. You know, that's where tattoos came from, because uh, the South Sea Islanders all had tattoos. So, anyway. But I went south. I went down to Jacksonville, where my sister lives. And uh, she's uh, my only, my only uh, sibling. She's seven years younger. And she had archived, collected and archived uh, all of the uh, family correspondence uh, our little family history into large loose leaf binders on a shelf and there were they're all about this thick and there's about 10 of them and uh, after my mother died uh, my sister got into the into her treasure chests and, and came up with all of the letters that she and her husband my father uh, had written to each other while he was at sea for 20 years did I did I just say 20 years I think so. My father graduated from Annapolis in 1929, and he was sent to, his first duty was on the Yangtze River in China, on the river boats that protected American interests in China in the 30s. Uh, he was on there for three years. Then he came back and he was on destroyers in the Atlantic. This was from 1934 until 1940, so he's six years in the Atlantic on destroyers, and you know what the Atlantic was like during the uh, second half of the 30s. Uh, Germany was rising and they began sinking ships, and these were convoy. The destroyers were, were taking convoys to England, and many destroyers got sunk. He was on the Reuben James, and I, got, and I was looking at the letters that he wrote from the Reuben James. And then he was transferred to the Barry, and then the Reuben James got sunk with all hands. And they even, they even made a song. There was a song about the Reuben, a folk song about the Reuben James going down with all hands. And so then the war started and he left and he went to the Pacific. And it was in the amphibious landings uh, that took the Marines to Guadalcanal. And then he was, uh, then he was still, then he, so we lived in San Diego. And then uh, after the war, he was at sea all during the war. And then after the war, instead of getting shore duty, he, he went back to China. And he was in the Seventh Fleet over there in China, uh, guarding American interests because the communists were taking over uh, China and Shanghai. The nationalists were being kicked over to Taiwan. And uh, so he was there for three years. So he didn't really, he was at sea from 1929 to 1949. Okay, 29, 39. 29 to 39, 39, that's 20 years. And then he got 
four years of shore duty and we moved to New Jersey and he was the commanding officer of the Jersey City Reserve Center and I spent two year, four years in uh, two little towns even when we were there we st kept on moving in New Jersey and then he went back to California and then back to sea and uh, then he uh, but he uh, kept being passed over and never became uh, captain uh, he he just uh, he got very uh, angry and disgusted with the Navy uh, and uh, resigned uh, uh, in 1955 so uh, or retired so he's a retired re honorary captain uh, so anyway that was the long story but what was in, what was valuable for me was that all these letters and uh, so I read them all and as I read them I began to see the other side of the equator you see because I you know from, we all look at our parents from uh, north of the equator right uh, from our side of the story but then all these letters revealed the other side of the story and they were so romantic and they were so uh, uh, longing for each other all these years of separation oh well soon I'll be home and uh, the weather was bad and only two more weeks and we'll be you know and oh I long for you and oh I got a letter from you today and I was so happy and uh, I look forward to when you're coming back and uh, all for, you know all these years it was unbelievable um, then there was then there was some uh, early with some letters I wrote my mother saved everything so then there's some letters as a little boy I wrote to my father saying, oh, I hope you come. I'm looking forward to you coming home, Daddy. And, and my father writing about I'll be able to come home and be and see little Eddie. They call me Eddie, you see. And uh, so this progressed, you know. And so then she saved the letters I wrote. And so then my uh, when I went to college and I, you know, I dropped out of college and joined the Navy, then I was writing home to Mom. <laughs> so there was Mom always getting letters from Gus and then letters from Eddie. Um, but anyway, it was just a uh, uh, diving, it was like a redwood tree or an oak tree uh, going back into the rings of its set when it was a sapling and reliving uh, the rings of your, of your uh, formative years and uh, seeing uh, uh, the other side to uh, a very, for me, a very um, uh, dim story. I don't really remember much about growing up, except uh, there are a few highlights, but my father was never there. Um, uh, I just have a few memories of him. Uh, my earliest remember of him was when uh, this guy in a white uniform coming in. I, I just have this memory of, we were living in a hotel in San Diego. Uh, and, our, and I just had this image of him in a white uniform. Um, and so the, the memories are dim. And um, he was never able, when he was home, even though he wrote about wanting to be with Eddie, uh, when he was with Eddie, he didn't know what to do with Eddie. <laughs> so there was a, uh, the, 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 the father, and then, then as his, as his life in the Navy did not come out to, well, he felt there was an injustice he, by getting past. And there were letters in there from his uh, uh, other uh, officers saying, well, I heard you got passed over. I'm so, uh, you know, what a disappointment to be passed over again. Uh, because, of course, when you're in the Navy, you want to rise up and get your command. You know, the whole idea of going to Annapolis and being a naval officer is to have a command. Uh, to get a ship, to be the, the captain of a ship, you know, that, that's the goal. That's the, the to be the, uh, because the captain of a ship, when he goes into a foreign port, is the direct emissary. If he's the captain of a ship, and that's the only Navy ship in the foreign port, he is the direct emissary of the President of the United States. He is the United States. He represents the country. And in a mythological, and I think mythologically, as you know, uh, mythologically, 
uh, the captain with the gold on his brim and the gold on his shoulders and the gold dripping off his buttons and the gold on his uh, sword is the direct emissary of God. He's the son of God, you see. So the naval officer uh, is a mythological figure of the son of God that on earth he is the direct emissary of God, you see. God's son. God's chosen. And this is a very powerful myth, and I think every son, uh, uh, every child, I don't want to exclude daughters, uh, have this mythic relationship to the father. Oh, he's so big, you know, so powerful. Oh, you know, that, that mythic relationship. And when that relationship is not uh, satisfied, and I don't know if it is ever satisfied, but uh, there's the, the, this creates a uh, biological relationship with the father, but it also creates a mythic relationship with the father. So there are two levels here, you see. And it's the mythic relationship that creates the journey of our life. So we all have this biological father, the imperfections and the perfections, and he was here and he was not here, and I wish he was here, and when he's here I wish he wasn't, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> Uh, you know, that, that physical level, you know. But there's this other dimension uh, that's going on that we, fair, we rarely recognize. So I wanted to speak a little bit about that uh, this morning. And I, I put this up because um, in Joseph Campbell, who mapped out this journey, I wish you would read Joseph Campbell and his works, particularly the journey of uh, the, the, the uh, um, uh, thousand... Uh, the Hero with a Thousand Faces. Uh, this was his, the, the book that got him uh, uh, in, uh, recognized. And basically he mapped out the mythic, the mythic, the journey of the hero, which is not male or female. It is basically the journey of the soul on its life journey to be atoned with, to, to, be rec to be reconciled with the Father. And the Father now mythically is source. So the Father is the source. So the journey is to the source and to become one with the source to heal the fragmentation of the, of the world, of your mind, and become one with your world and yourself and the Father. So that's when Jesus says, you know, the Father and I are one. He's speaking from a place where he has been, uh, where atonement with the Father has happened. The unity of Father and Son has been completed and they're one. The Father and I are one. Is is a completion of the duality and the fragmentation of the mind and our seeking for God and truth and who I am, you see. So this, this uh, Campbell maps it out as a uh, circle well, like this and going around and there's a line going across here and so I'm, I'm connecting dots and that line is the uh, is the uh, the, is, is, uh, the the equator on the earth the symbol of that line uh, south of the border which you go on 95 you're going south of the border and it's kind of like a celebration you know so they're going through something uh, the, this, this line here is also a line between the conscious everyday mind, your everyday mind now, and the great unconscious or the unknown. <coughs> so this represents here, uh, and he, words fail us, we have to really think symbolically here, uh, because nothing really, language is up here, and language cannot describe what's down here. Language can't go here. Language can't go into what you don't know. Language can't go into the unconscious. So it's a symbolic world. And we forget this, you see. This is a prose world. This is a logical world. Everyday mind is logical and rational and all supposed to make sense. If it doesn't make sense, it's because we have elements down here that we have not integrated. So this is elements, this is like all that I have not integrated, all that I'm pushing out, all that I don't know, all that I refuse to see, all that I'm afraid to see is down here. 
and the, and the hero, the journeyer, the seeker, the one who's hungry for truth, the one who's hungry for God, for source, uh, the hungry, hungry to heal, hungry to be at peace, hungry to be complete, is going to go here. And so what all of our life, you see, is really spent in uh, integrating the fragmented elements of our own consciousness in the world. And, um, and it's all of our stories and movies and everything are about this. I have a little submarine here. When I joined the Navy, I got in the submarines. And, and metaphorically, I look at this. It was just being in the submarines, and that was a fact. But metaphorically, I was going into the deep of the, o of the ocean. While everyone else was up on the surface, I was going there. And that's where I went in my life. And um, did you ever see the movie uh, uh, Conception with um, Leonardo? And the reason I bring that up, it just popped in my mind, was that uh, this was about a uh, team that would go into the dreams of another person and go down into the storehouse, down to the bottom of the subconscious, and they would put a message in a lockbox down there, so when that person woke up, he would want to do that. So they were kind of like a, uh, subconscious programmers. But one thing they had to always take with them was a totem. And that totem was in their pocket. It would be something that no one else knew about. And you had this totem. And so if you went down into the unconscious, if you went down into the realm beneath, if you went down into Neptune, like uh, parts of the Caribbean, if you go down into the unconscious of your life, you're going to, like Odysseus, you're going to encounter worlds, you're going to encounter states of mind, you're going to encounter archetypes or demons, you're going to encounter blissful places where you don't want to sleep, where you want to stay, and just uh, you don't want to continue your journey, you see. And so you have to take a totem with you so that if you see that totem, you will remember that you're on a journey and you will leave that island, you will leave that place, you will continue on, and you will continue back up to the surface, you see. And this is, and I just reached my pot, this is my, I never realized what it was, but this is my totem, it's a little yantra. A uh, little mandala, uh, and uh, the, it's kind of like in, in the movie Inception. It was kind of like that. You pull that out. <gasps> I remember. I can. I gotta leave. I gotta go. I'm on a journey. You see. I cannot stay. I cannot stay here. So there's don't get stuck there. And so many of us get stuck there. People that get stuck. When you're stuck, that means that you're just in a kind of like a Groundhog Day. I know we all we all do this when we uh, if we if we're a traveler and we've been places and we go back home and we see the people that we that were there before and they're still talking about the same things that they did uh, when we left you know and uh, you realize how you've changed and they're still in the same place you see and so we encounter this all the time where uh, we get stuck and there's a particular Hey, I will, well, there's, a lot, there's enough comfort here for me, so I won't go on. I'll stay here. Or we get stuck in that we can't find the exit, and we just keep going around and around trying to find the exit out of this hell hole, you see. We get stuck in heavens and hells down here. And we can spend a whole lifetime. I know I've spent decades in some of these heavens or hells. Most of them for me were hells. <laughs> but you can't find a way out of hell, you see. Uh, uh, so you keep going in circles looking. It's like when you lose your car keys in the house and you keep looking everywhere uh, and you and uh, you can't find it and you find and you just realize now, you know, that you just looked under that book five times as if it would suddenly appear. And it's kind of like that. So there, there are several things that you need on this to succeed on this journey south of the border. Uh, you need to have the sword of discernment. And usually in the myths, uh, the hero, before he begins his journey, is given a, a weapon or a boon. He's got some special power. He's got something that will uh, enable him to get free from the archetypes of the unconscious. He, he gets some weapon that he can use uh, so he won't get stuck. And all the myths and stories are about this too. 
Uh, I, and I, this is my, my, this was my father's Annapolis sword, you see, with the gold that dripped down from God and landed on the handle. And, uh, and I know it's my sword because uh, it's, uh, it's got USN, it's got some fancy engravements, and it's got my father's name on it, Edwin Gus Conley. And that, that, I'm a junior, that's my name. So yeah, that's my name. This is my sword. Uh, after my mother died, I found it buried in a trunk, <laughs> in the bottom of a trunk. And, uh, and uh, so a sword of discernment is mythically, the sword of discernment is what you, is the sword of discernment. And discernment means the ability to tell the real from the unreal. And we all have this sword. We all realize when something's fake. Suddenly we, we realize when we've been deceived. We realize when something I thought was real is not real. That's the sword. It cuts away, it cuts through the unreal, cuts the unreal from the real. And you can't and you can't make this journey unless you have that sword. And the other and the other uh, thing that you're given before you make your journey, and I just pointed that out to you, but it is a totem, which means remember me. Okay, now, if you notice, uh, in the uh, churches, I know in the Presbyterian church here, the communion table has in remembrance of me, okay? So you're on a journey to meet the Father. You're on a journey to find the Father. So these are the, the seven things that you need in order to complete the journey. And so you, you I'm 80 years old, so I, I can look back on my journey and uh, I can see the map. I can see the sections where I, I can see the heavens and the hells where I got stuck. I can see the, uh, the groundhog days. I can see the, the uh, cycles. I can see the, the uh, um, symbols, the archetypes that I did battle with. Uh, they're all forces of the mind. Uh, these archetypes uh, in mythology, they're the demons and the devils and all that. But that's just uh, dragons and, and uh, all of these are different. They're basically, uh, the, the language we use symbolizes these forces, you see, these forces of the psyche, the forces of your own psyche, the... the uh, um, there's no uh, devils out there or anything. It's all forces of you, all parts of you that need to be integrated, that need to be uh, dealt with and accepted and integrated. So this, this journey is a path of integrating. It's not a path of uh, uh, killing in any way. And, oh, by the way, here at the top, all of my talks are on my blog, tokillaminotaur.com, to kill a minotaur. Well, that's a myth about going into the unconscious, too. And coming back. And come back, you see. Uh, and when you come back, you, you come back to the everyday world, but now it's different. When you left, it was, it, it was a hell. When you left, it was a place you had to get out of. It was a place that you had to leave. It was a place that you had to heal. And you make this journey. And, you, and when you return, you return to where you started. You come home, and it was where you began. But everything is different. Everything is new. But yet it's the old. So when you return from this journey, and it can be a very short journey. I'm not, I'm not talking about 80 years now of journeys. I mean, you're not nobody. You're not, I don't think I'm talking to anybody that's 80. Uh, maybe, but but the the point is that this journey happens in small segments or in a lifespan. It, it's whether it's like a book. You got the whole book and you got chapters, and each chapter is a journey. So every one of you is in a particular chapter, and maybe if you're older enough, you have several chapters behind you. But when you leave one chapter and go to the next chapter, you go through a passage. So each one is kind of like going south of the border. I'm going, I got a new chapter in my life now. I just moved to California or something. I just got a new marriage or something. That's a new journey. 
you still you, you're still there is there is a uh, path through that there are things to be discovered there there are demons to be encountered there are white there are whale there are monsters of the deep you have to meet all of these you see and so life is made up of chapters but then you have the whole book and each each chapter is basically the same thing each chapter is basically the same journey, only it has, it's at a deeper, another layer. It's like the rings in a tree. You start out with the, with the one, you see, and then every year the tree adds a ring. So the rings keep expanding, like an expanding universe, you see. So each of us is like a tree. We start out with one, and we keep expanding chapters. And each chapter is a journey. I move here. Conditions change. People change. I leave. And we leave because of the pressure of life, you see. The pressure of the tree. The tree doesn't stay as a sapling. The tree keeps expanding its rings of stories, you see. Because of this life's pressure, life is expanding energy. Life is ever expanding. Life is ever learning, ever creating. And so that life force, you see, moves us into this journey. And we, have, we either answer the call or we don't. This is what Joseph Campbell pointed out. Every one of us hears the call, no matter where we are in life, that call is, is being heard. And we're either turning away from it, I don't want to listen to that, I want, I want to stay in this place here, I got my comforts here, I got my little routines, everything is fine, I don't want to change, I'm afraid of the deep. Or we turn and we hear the call, and it becomes the call of the sirens, and it's irresistible, and we have to go. And when we go, you see, on our journey, that means we have to, uh, there's a death there, because you have to, in order to go on the journey, you have to let go of what you're holding on to. So the journey is always a death and a life, life and death. There's always a letting go, and there's always a birth of the new. But we don't get the new birth until we let go of the old, you see. We don't get to heaven until we let go of hell. And then that heaven becomes hell and we let go of that. The new ring happens, you see. Ever-expanding life. Ever-expanding integration. Ever-expanding integration. Ever-expanding consciousness. Ever-expanding realization. Ever-expanding, aha, I see. Ever-expanding understanding, you see. Never stops. You're always conscious expanding and and so this journey is to make the conscious unconscious conscious basically there are many ways to map it out but you could say basically that the journey of life is to make the unknown known to make the unconscious conscious ever expanding consciousness and consciousness is joy. Consciousness is awareness. And you see, consciousness makes the unknown known, you see. And as soon as we stop following the call, uh, everything begins to freeze up. Everything begins to gel. Consciousness be slips away and we become pretty much unconscious again. And we know we're unconscious when we're going in circles. When we're, when we're in the Groundhog Day, that's what that movie was all about. Uh, breaking out of the, the karma. Karma means going in circles, <laughs> repeating yourself, living in a pattern. So anyway, I went down uh, this whole trip this weekend. To me, it was kind of like I'm, I'm putting it in a mythic terms here, a metaphorical terms here. But it was going back into the letters uh, of my past. Uh, thankful that my mother saved everything, my report cards, all the letters, the letters the teachers wrote, uh, the letters I wrote, uh, uh, my, all of my little, my, the rings in my tree uh, were saved uh, and uh, put, in, put in cellophane pages uh, by my sister. And I spent the afternoon uh, going into the rings of my tree and uh, getting a bigger picture of the 
of the uh, land, which was my parents, and the times, uh, the conditions that they lived in, and the, uh, the uh, separation that they did. A whole, for 20 years, a whole marriage was like a continuous honeymoon. Uh, if you marry a truck driver, I think it's like that. Because you look at it, it was basically uh, uh, the whole the whole twenty years was uh, when are you coming back? And then there was no letters written when he got back, but it was always just for a couple of days or a week, two weeks, and then gone again. And then oh, I just got a letter from you today, and I was so happy. Uh, and uh, and the, I didn't apologizing for not writing and everything. Cause he and when he was in the war. Uh, he couldn't say anything. Everything was censored. So there really wasn't any description of what was going on because all that was censored, you see. So it was always kind of trivial, unfortunately. Uh, they really couldn't get into this. Uh, my, my mother did. I mean, she could say what was going on in the family, what Eddie was doing and all that. But um, as far as my father's writing descriptive read letters of where he was and what he was doing, that wasn't there. It was always... Uh, just uh, the sea was rough today, and, and uh, I'm looking forward to being home, and yeah, you know, very very shallow kind of things. But the longing was there, and the the uh, the pain of this uh, being in a world, a crazy world, in which uh, uh, you could not be at one with your uh, chosen other. You see. So anyway, I'll let that go today. And uh, thank you for dropping in, and I'm glad to be back from my, uh, oh, 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 one more thing. And uh, so I was looking through uh, the archives, and there's this, this, uh, when, this was the Order of Neptune. Uh, I don't know if you can see that or not, but it was a big diploma uh, my father got when he went over the equator. It's big, uh, it looks like it would be something in the parts of the Caribbean, uh, with all the mermaids and the, and the, uh, uh, demons of the deep, you know, and so this going across the equator is a metaphor for going the hero's journey into the unknown, into the unknown and the unconscious, and coming back again with the treasure that you discovered there. So, thank you for uh, dropping in, and I'm glad to be back, uh, back into the conscious world of Blackstone <laughs> and Facebook. Thank you.